Welcome to the Teaching Value and Healthcare Learning Network. Join us to hear leaders in the field share practical and tangible advice about how to develop engaging curriculum and health system innovation to train a new generation of healthcare providers from diverse specialties and professions skilled to deliver high value care. You might be listening to us via podcast or watching our video. Either way, we welcome you to join us and learn with us. This learning network was developed by Casa Care and the ABM Foundation to share ideas, educational materials, and strategies in an open forum. Our goal is to discuss ways to get started, to implement, and to sustain feasible innovations and in teaching value at your institutions across the US and, and across the world. I am Chris Moriades, I'm a hospital medicine physician and assistant dean for healthcare value at the new Dell Medical School in UT Austin and director of implementation for Casa Care. And I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm really honored to have with us uh, Dr. Lauren Demosthenes. Dr. Demosthenes is an OBGYN and Medical Director of Value Care and Innovation at Greenville Health System. She'll be discussing some of the high value care programs she started in South Carolina, and also about some of the work she's helped lead nationally to bring this issue to the forefront within OBGYN. So Lauren, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks so much. I've um, been hoping to do something like this for you, with you for a while. So just to give you some background, I'm an OBGYN, and I started, I've been in practice for 31 years. So my whole career, I was always highly aware of um, the fee-for-service environment that we were practicing in. It never felt quite right to me. So I had an opportunity in 2012 to participate in a scholars and leaders program, and I did my project on cost awareness and OBGYN. And it just unfolded um, a lot of information about how much we don't know the costs and charges of products and services and operations that we provide to our patients on an everyday basis. So I was fortunate to um, have lots of doors open for me after that project. Um, I met Neil Shaw, who's an OBGYN. He introduced me to a lot of people and said, uh, we really welcome you to write clinical vignettes and submit them to things like JAMA Teachable Moments and things like that. So I got my residents um, interested about writing clinical vignettes and trying to um, show best practices, following guidelines and different ways of handling a problem. And we started submitting. And lo and behold, we found out that our topics were all OBGYN. <laughs> and, uh, so we were having some trouble getting into the general internal medicine field with our vignettes. So I, uh, I'm also on the program committee of the American College of OBGYN annual clinical meeting. So I've gotten a chance to meet the leadership at ACOG and I said, I really, really think this is something that we need to do for our own specialty. So through the uh, beginning of that time, we, we were able to get something through our Council of Resident Education for OBGYN on the ACOG website. So now our own OBGYN residents nationally can submit cases of vignettes as illustrating different ways to perform high quality care. So what our hope is, is that it'll be a catalog of um, cases that a program director or a resident can go to they can submit their own case, but they can also use these cases to bring up for their discussion in their own institution. So right now we're just in the process of gathering cases so residents can get uh, a publication on the website. We can, I'm gonna work on uh, doing a video uh, or PowerPoint that we can put on there as also a tool in our educational toolbox. And that way a program director doesn't have to start fresh. They can just go in and use the PowerPoint that we've developed and show how it affects OBGYN. Um, so as you know, or as you may not know, 25% of all the hospital costs in our country are due to OBGYN. So it's one of the, uh, it's just a very prevalent utilization of services. So it really does matter that if our specialty really pays attention to this, because uh, lots of hospital admissions are obstetric, maternity admissions, and newborn admissions. Uh, so we've been able to get it done nationally, uh, and then locally, we've taken it to our GME uh, committee. We have general surgery, orthopedic surgery, family medicine, internal medicine, and OBGYN 
and we're doing something similar to what other places are doing. We have a, a high value vignette competition every year. So we get submissions from all of GME. And we also just started a, our own journal for our health system. And we have a series called Value Vignettes. So I've, I've kind of been all over the board with um, getting things started. And so now they are highlighting value vignettes that are submitted by people from our health system. So that's what we're doing here. Um, and then we're also, we also have a new med school, not as new as your med school, but we're in our fifth year and we, I'm starting, um, I have an elective on value care for our fourth year med students. And then we're seriously thinking of a longitudinal track of distinction in high value and quality. So we're making a lot of progress. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Lauren, what I, I love about that story, there are a couple things that I, I really uh, connect with. Um, but one is you, like many of the folks that we've featured on here, have had significant achievements and, and gained traction, both locally and then now nationally with, with developing the series. Um, and I think when we provide an introduction or if someone's to look at your CV, it looks like these things just, you know, oh, wow, these things just happened. Right, like uh, I'm never going to be able to do, it. And, and and I think nicely you've overcome so many barriers, uh, both locally and nationally. I mean, even the story, it's like you submitted a paper to JAMA Internal Medicine, it got rejected because it was the wrong uh, subject matter, perhaps. And instead of you know quitting there, you did not. You started a whole series and said we need to right. do this on our own. So I think it's a really important message about how you became interested and how you you. Uh, faced so many different barriers and yet have have now pushed through and, and gotten such traction. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Maybe the barriers when you first started bringing up cost amongst your colleagues um, clinically um, and, and then maybe also in, in the education realm. Yeah, so um, as I said, I was in a practice in 2012 and I was really enjoying medical education and, and this idea just was something I had been passionate about for a long time. So it, it opened the doors. Was it a pushback? Um, yes. It's an uncomfortable topic and it, but I guess it helped in a way that I've been in practice for so many years here. So I had, you know, I wasn't a newcomer trying to come in. They, um, also have kind of a dog with a bone kind of personality. So I've been, I, they know I'm gonna take something and go with it. And then I think at the very same time, our healthcare system is extremely supportive of high value care. So I got a, a lot of support from the, the CEO to, to educate our residents and practicing clinicians about this. And my department chair actually created the job that I have now just because he feels like it's so important that we that we um, do value as well as quality that he created this job that I did pretty much as a volunteer for a couple of years to get started and now it's a position and and you know he's been extremely supported and committed to the mission so that has helped um, and it, it so there have been barriers but not to the point where if it doesn't work I don't find another open door, or find some another avenue to get it done. Yeah, and I was recently asked actually by a group of residents about career opportunities related to this idea, this field of high value care. Um, I think uh, it's it's so clear that there there are now people um, like yourself and, and like myself actually, who uh, by pursuing this topic have found uh, opportunities. And it's, it's interesting because it's a situation where you can't point to and say, well, you could be this job. It's these job descriptions that are being made up um, and, and, and being created um, as we speak. And so I, I think that's a, another great thing of pushing for years, getting some traction and then, and then creating a, an actual position within the health system um, to help lead that work. I feel like quality is really turning into value. So when I think of value, it's quality plus service. So in obstetrics, we want to provide options for women. So that service. So I just think that quality by itself now includes um, different options for women in terms of childbirth and uh, 
And so I've been able to also take these vignettes and turn them into QI projects for the residents, which is how they get published. So a vignette can be the foundation of a QI project, and that's been working really well, too. Cool. Um, for, the, for the people listening, can you perhaps give us a kind of concrete example of maybe a, what a vignette looks like, a, an example, and then how that turned into a QI project? Sure, sure. So uh, this was a simple one that a resident did recently. Uh, so we have a protocol, and it's even in our EMR, to prescribe an oral antibiotic um, preoperatively for a certain outpatient case that we perform. So it's part of the standing orders already, but what we found out was that oftentimes due to logistics and timing, the patient was taken back to the operating room without receiving the oral antibiotic. And so anesthesia would then say, do you want antibiotics? And they would give it intravenously. Mm -hmm. So we just started being aware that um, just due to process, it was being administered in a way that was not as cost effective. So we looked up the cost of the IV version of the same antibiotic as the oral version, and it was you know, quite a bit more expensive. And it, so it turned into something that she'll do as a quality improvement project and then track it. And we're really doing that all over. So we're, we're finding products that are being used that there's an alternate product that's less expensive, but we didn't know that. We didn't know that until we researched it, found out from our business department. And, and then we're tracking all these things because the motto that I like of, you know, what that you have to measure something to, to prove that you're sustaining your intervention. Uh, so we're also planning to monitor these things so we can make sure our interventions are sustained when we have a new group of residents or new group of anesthesia people. It's, uh, so it's not, not terribly hard to think of, but it is difficult to implement because it takes so many team members you have to educate nursing, anesthesia, and, and uh, more than anything, it's changed the culture. So even though we might identify something that seems small in the big picture, we're, we're finding so many opportunities to improve that it's changing the culture of thinking quite a bit. I think that's certainly been the experience of many uh, people we've spoken to uh, via this series over the last um, year and a half or so. I think we've been at it. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's getting that toe in the door and starting to, to get a few examples and projects and, and people thinking that way. Um, and even the ones that, that seem small tend to continue to change the way people think about, about their job. And I guess to that point, the example you used really focused on cost. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely hear from people, especially if I travel around, that uh, docs don't care about costs, trainees don't really care. Um, I don't know that that's really been my direct experience. I'd love to hear your reflections on that. If you found that people get behind this idea of, like, why are we spending this extra money? Or if you sometimes hit uh, some, some roadblocks in, in that um, addressing cost. I did before, but I been doing this now another thing i've started is a value care conference and i i just take a patient and i follow her through her course of care in the hospital and have been able to show duplication of tests um unnecessary testing not intentional but all by just the normal hectic everyday care of a patient but then what i've done is been able to find out that um perhaps that patient has a percent copay of that bill, which is based on charges, so that indeed it does matter to the patient uh, when you look at an itemized bill. And in our payment reform, we are anticipating in the future that there'll be um, bundles and that it'll be, it, it's better for the patient to not duplicate testing if they are going to be responsible for a percent of their bill, but it's also you know, it's just the right thing to do for society. If, if we're working in a, a, a public payment system, I feel like it's our duty to be uh, aware of the resources that we're spending. And, I, and it's, I don't think we're getting nearly as much pushback because I think people are starting to understand it does filter down to the patient and it filters down to our society. Mm -hmm. So it, 
that's been a, a pretty big change over the last four years as well. Um, but it's all from constant discussion about it in our department and um, and support from the healthcare system. They want us to do the best thing for our patients. Right, and so that's great. And you're talking about the local now. Thinking about um, working with the professional society, I, I'm imagining that people listening um, are from all different disciplines. Uh, I, I've spoken to people uh, here locally in Austin who said they've listened to our podcast. One was an interventional radiologist, another was a hospitalist. Um, and so uh, do you have lessons for people just generally about engaging professional societies or sort of how that's worked for you um, as, a, as a venue to kind of move the work nationally? Yes. Um, so I think the, the topic right now is of great interest. So in, in terms of working with ACOG, our American College of OBGYN, I was aware that the Journal of Hospitalist Medicine has that series called what? Um, things We the, Do For No Reason. So there's a series, Things We Do For No Reason, Hospital Medicine. I know that, you know, I've been very familiar with the uh, ACP high value care curriculum. So I think that all the societies are probably very open to having somebody champion the cause. And, and like you said, I'm not an academician. I'm not from a big, I'm from a large healthcare system, but not, um, I mean, I was able to do this just with persistence and one-on-one -on -one discussion because I think our national societies are very open to membership, calling them up and saying, I have a great idea. I mean, I've had that experience with ACOG. They, they just said, sure, we would like to talk to you about it. So they were open and they, they said, this is an important topic and we want to train our trainees. So it, I haven't, I've had, I wouldn't say barriers. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but I haven't had anybody shut the door and say no. Yeah. I think it's a, the way we need to go to our society and our patients. And being, uh, so you said something that made me think about, you know, being a busy practicing clinician, OBGYN, um, certainly at first this work was done, I assume, on the margins, right? It's done <laughs> at some, some point during the time um, that you find yourself early in the morning, late at night, on weekends, or something like that. Um, so what was it that really motivated you to, to do this? Because I know some people may think, look, that's, that's all great, but it's not part of my job. Um, I'm not being paid to do this. Well, as I said, I, I was in practice for 31 years and, and just um, maybe the way I was raised about <laughs> values from childhood about that you should not do things that don't need to be done. So it was just an interest I had my whole career. And I think timing was good with our medical school opening and they wanted innovative thinkers and the opportunity for the leadership program came up. But I, I mean, some of it has to be some internal drive. You're right. It, it was an internal drive thing, but it did turn into um, a career, which I think a lot of things probably can happen that way. Things lined up correctly for me. But I would say it's internal drive. It wasn't yeah. at the beginning because of anybody asking me to do it. It was... And it's that internal drive, I think, for many of us, that real realization, once you start digging in as you did and seeing the scope of the problem and starting to understand things that we haven't looked at, like cost, and, and tying that back to sort of all of our motivation to, do, to provide the best care possible to patients, right? So I think that is an important message that it wasn't in response, and obviously it wasn't as much before, but it wasn't like this was in response to macro or any of these other things. It really was because, you know, you didn't want to be providing overuse or doing things that didn't make sense um, and providing the best care to our patients. And I, I feel like that is um, a really important motivation. You know, IHI oftentimes says, uh, and I, I think uh, Maureen uh, Bisignano popularized this or perhaps with Dr. Work, but, but we all have two jobs in healthcare, right? We, we all have the care we provide to our patients and then a, a job, a responsibility to improve the system that we, in which we provide care. Um, and so I think I, I just I, I'm glad to hear that uh, sort of message come through from you, which was that you were driven internally and it, it was seen as just part of part of your work, even if it wasn't kind of the, the compensated role. So um, I think really important as a 
as we finish up here, um, Lauren, any other uh, things you want to share with everybody or, or lessons that you've learned over the, over the years? There is a, a screenshot of the American College of OBGYN call for submission. So if somebody wants to uh, model a homegrown program after it, the guidelines are there. Uh, I think this, you can also take whatever ideas you hear and do them um, system-wide in your department. Uh, I like that we're working across GME programs here and I found champions in each department. So it can be done. Residents are interested, medical students are interested, and uh, patients, they do want to know, you know, doctor, how much is this going to cost? And so I think we want to be able to tell them that information and it's just easier now. I, I think I might be a little unusual in that I've done this for so long where some of you have not done this long. So I've lived through lots of different changes in healthcare and I like this change. I think it's good for patients. Great. That's perfect. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to be announcing very soon our next iteration of the Cost of Care and ABM Foundation Creating Value Challenge nationally. Um, so everybody should stay tuned for some information, but certainly the projects that you've talked about and, and that you've worked on there uh, locally, the creating the local high value care competition you have um, is great fodder for that. So uh, we're looking for individuals and really groups, institutions such as yourself to be um, submitting uh, so that we can kind of help spread the word um, in as many ways as we can about good ideas on how we can improve care um, and provide high value care for our patients. So Lauren, thank you so much for joining us and for the great discussion. Um, everybody listening, remember you can go to our uh, Teaching Value Learning Network. You can check out the Tools for Educators link off the main page. Um, and uh, Lauren, we'll, we'll post something there also about the ACOG so that, that the instructions are there. Um, so folks can go there to, to, uh, to um, get those resources. We'd like this community to be yours, so please help us to contribute to Learning Network. Let us know what resources will be most helpful for you. Um, please post and, and keep it up, uh, the momentum of making this an active community. We invite you all to join us again next month in November. We'll have another fantastic guest speaker to discuss their innovations. So thank you for joining us, and everybody have a great rest of your day.